Hi everyone, welcome to our first in our series of tutorials based on using 1630 by BJB. Today we are going to be covering making a core like this. So this is what we're going to be using if we sculpt or whatever. It's the first part of the prosthetic process is you have to have a core. Some people call it a positive and you sculpt straight onto this. If you turn around you'll notice that this particular one is hollow in the back which is great because it saves us a lot of material. If we poured this flat it would take a lot of material and it would be quite heavy. 1630 is at what's called a filled urethane. So it's a urethane. What is urethane? You're probably asking. Uh, it's a compound, it's a um, synthetic compound and it can be either a rubber or a plastic or well, um, you know, a variety of different things, but uh, this particular product uh, has has fillers in it, like like metal powders that that make it really good for uh, foam latex molds. I use this for almost all of my foam latex molds, and it uh, conducts heat really nicely, evenly, and uh, that's part of the reason also why we want to have this hollow like this in the back, so that the heat can penetrate evenly through the whole mold and bake your foam evenly. If this was solid, the stuff on the edges here where it's thinner would be uh, overbaked and by the time the heat went all the way through here you might find areas here that are uncured because the heat hasn't gone all the way through. It might take you know maybe an hour for it to go all the way through here whereas when it's like this maybe it may take half that time and it will take probably about the same amount of time to go through here as it is to go through here. So this is what we're making today. So, uh, for example, this is what it looks like once something is sculpted onto it. And I'll be showing you guys how to mold this later on using a syntactic dough system. Uh, but that'll be another tutorial. So today we're also going to be using, those of you who watched our uh, tutorial on making a box mold, we're going to be using a box mold which I use for pulling out this particular face. Now this face is um, an Asian face which I use, I do a lot of work over in Hong Kong. So I have Asian face generic faces uh, because their facial structure is slightly different. So this is one of the uh, faces that I'm going to be using over there for Halloween this year. So, so let's get into it 1630. So when you purchase your kit of 1630 and it comes in uh, two gallon two gallon cans like this it comes with these little clips on which I guess prevent it from opening. You see that oftentimes the cans get a little beat up as they're getting shipped um, so it stops the lid from from popping off and uh, spilling your stuff so you're just gonna have to get a screwdriver or something small and uh, just pull these off. Before you can access what's inside. Now there are a couple of down negative things, downsides to 1630. Um, there's a lot of positives, but with all materials, it's not suitable for everything. Um, part of the part of the biggest problem with 1630 for me is that it, it really likes to settle. The fillers all settle to the bottom, and it's. A little bit it's a little bit of a pain just to, to, to get it um, sorted so you can actually uh, pour it up and mix it and work with it so I'll show you how to do that okay so we've got it ready now like all urethanes you want to keep the lid on airtight when you're not using it uh, otherwise it can go crusty okay so this is part A and this is part B. Now part B is the one that really likes to settle and I'm sure that when we open this you can see that it's very 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 clear. Okay. Now part A really sorry part B should be a creamy almost white color so you can see straight away that that is uh, settled in the bottom a lot 
it's really settled. So it should be this color. So you can see that uh, that's going to really need to get mixed up well in order to be able to use it. And it is quite uh, it's quite heavy. So we're not, you know you could sit there and kind of just do this, you know, and and mix it all by hand with a paint stick. It'll take you a little while. I have done it. Uh, it's it's a pain, but it can be done. What I prefer to do is I prefer to take a drill with an attachment kind of like this on the end and then uh, this is what's called a driver it only has one speed which is full <laughs> so if you're trying to do it with a regular drill it can be a little harder this has got a really you know quite a strong motor in it um, you can use larger ones that have the handles on the sides they work pretty well as uh, as well so um, let me show you how to how to mix this up safely Right, so it's easier to do this on the floor so that you can hold it with your feet. Now, when you put your feet there, make sure that you're holding them really, really snugly. If you don't, the can will spin and you'll get 1630 everywhere. And I've done that quite a few times and I've got pants that are just caked with the stuff and it will not wash off. So make sure that you're holding it um, really tightly and that you're wearing shoes and jeans that you really don't care if you get some stuff on. So, uh, let's have a look. Okay. So we're gonna hold that really snugly. And just kind of work, work up and down around the side. Whatever you do, don't pull that up while it's moving, otherwise it's going to spatter it all over the floor and all over your pants. So, that's now fully mixed and ready to use. We can wash this off by uh, running it in some acetone. And then we just then we can just wipe it off with some paper towel and we'll be able to use that on, on our part A because you don't want to you want to make sure that you don't have any of the um, any of the other part left on it when when you do this otherwise it uh, will cause problems this one here doesn't seem to be as bad with the uh, settling. And again, we're just going to Give this a rinse out, and I tilt it so that the, the, the acetone will go right to the edge of the thing, so that it washes the whole the whole sort of long part here as well. So that's how you prep it. Now that it's prepped, uh, I'm using a a different kit. I don't, I'm not going to use this one, so I'm just going to go ahead and and close this one up and I have it here somewhere you want to make sure that you hammer the lids down really well um, so that air doesn't get in and make them crusty and, and messed up first thing 
that we need to do is to create a handle and this handle will go in the back of our core so that it'll be easier for us to be able to demold it and handle it, pull it out when we've run stuff. So uh, the first thing you probably will notice is that we have a bevel. So it, it, it's not a straight, it's not like this side here, which is just perfectly flat. It's on just a slight angle. And the reason for that is that uh, when we put it in, Okay, the, the sides of the, of the core are actually tapered, They're not, it's not a straight up and down so that it doesn't lock in. So as it pulls out, it actually is easy to get out. So we want it to be as close to that as possible and we also want to stop it from being able to spin. So if it's, if it's angled, it, it's not going to be able to spin because it'll be all locked in by the material. So that's what we're wanting to do. So I'm just going to set this here. Notice I'm setting it slightly in from the edge. I'm not doing it right up to the edge. And then I'm just going to mark it slightly in from the edge there. Make sure that the longest point of the bevel is on the top. Um, otherwise it's not going to be even. So you can see that that's been marked. And then we go to our chop saw. Make sure that it's set on the same angle. Uh, and then it's just a matter of making sure that when we're looking down on it, that, that the bevel is the right way. Oops. And... Okay, so now you can see that we've got a bevel that is even, and when we put it in, we'll sit slightly down from the top. You don't want it to be right up near the top. Uh, you want it to be buried in, in quite a bit of material so that it locks it in there really well, so that when you're yanking on it, it's not gonna bust off this much of the material. It's got a good amount in there, and, uh, and that should do a good job. You can see that that's pretty See that that's pretty uh, nicely matching the bevel on the mold and so that'll lock it in really nicely. But once we get a layer or so of material it's probably going to sit up about this high. It's not going to be quite so low because there will be some material already in there before we put the handle in. So we've mixed up our part A and our part B. We're ready to mix them in the bucket. This bucket's not as clean as I would normally like, but it'll be okay. One thing I noticed, this is not a brand new bucket. This is uh, one, but I don't think that the lid was on properly. So you'll notice that uh, there are some kind of lumps where the surface started to, to thicken because the air was getting to it, which is part of the problem with urethane. This, uh, Normally I would say this was uh, no good, but I don't want to waste the material, so I'm going to strain out some of the lumps. Now you can do this with a paint strainer, with a bit of jersey knit uh, mesh. Um, I'm just going to use today a piece of burlap, so you can see it's a little bit, uh, little bit porous. So that should, um, I guess, help us to strain out some of these some of these lumps and I'm just gonna sort of tension it around like that. It's just gonna take a little while to to pour it. But make sure that it's not gonna let any lumps through. Oop. Now, we're going to do the print coat, and uh, the print coat is very important because it has all of our 
all of our surface detail. So we want to make sure that we get a nice, strong, sturdy print coat that uh, there's no thin spots that could cause problems for us later. So I'm going to do 400 of each part A and part B giving us a total of 800. So I'm at 347, 348 right now. So use this as a lesson that uh, when you're working with 1630 you always put your lid on well otherwise you can lose quite a bit of material. Okay, so that's 400. I'm just going to discard this. So 400, tear that off, put 400 of this part. Whoops, I'm just a smidge over. So. so there was 12, I went 12 over, so now I need to put this to 24. And I'm using the stick to make sure I'm not adding any lumps, because I don't want lumps in there. sure that we stir this up really thoroughly. You don't want to see any swirls, no marbling, and of course be checking to make sure no lumps made it through into our print coat. Can't see any. Normally they are noticeable on the top. There's one. Just because I noticed a couple of lumps, I'm just going to do a bit of a strain on this too, just to catch any large lumps. You can see there's one right there. We don't want that in. Normally, if it's a brand new kit, you're not going to have to go through all this trouble. There was one. Oh, can't see it. Oh. Yeah, I'll just add it. I'll pull them out later. Make sure that you grab gloves that are not um, dissolved by acetone. These are nitrile ones. You can use latex as well unless you're going to be running uh, platinum silicone. And then we start brushing up the sides. And if you see any, any lumps, We'll just pull them out. Here's one. As I said, normally if you're using a nice fresh thing or you've been better at keeping your lid on, you're not going to have to worry about these lumps. But I thought it was probably worthwhile showing you guys how to deal with it. Um, there's a lump there. Should you come across them? 
or should you forget to put your lid on properly. I think it's always, it's always good to teach um, how to fix problems uh, in tutorials rather than having everything be absolutely perfect. So you'll probably notice quite a bit with my tutorials that I'll be like, you know, this has happened, it's not perfect, this is how we fix it. Um, and then that way you get a little bit more well versed in the material. Now this takes probably about 10 to 15 minutes uh, of time to to start to thicken. So the more that you move it around, see how I'm moving it around, it uh, keeps it more liquid, makes it set longer. If I just left this to do its chemical thing, it would it would start setting much earlier. But I want to make sure that I'm getting as as nice of a print coat as I can. There's a lump there by the look of it. Oops. There's another one. And another one. You can see it's so running, it's basically just running straight down. Uh, so we just keep going until it thickens to a point that we can drag a nice, a nice layer up and it'll, it'll stay put. And you'll notice that it will slowly, slowly slow down, start to drag running downwards. When we first started, it was running down pretty much straight away. Now it's um, thickening up a little bit. Now you'll notice, if you look down into the mold, there's these two, these two high points, okay, right here and right here. You see them? Okay, they are the tear duct area of the positive. You want to make sure that you leave a decent coat on those. You don't want to have that too thin because uh, it can bust through. So you want to make sure at least it's flat and covers those. If uh, by some chance it does get a little thin, you can always add a little bit more material in this next uh, in this next stage, but it's always easy to make sure you don't you don't just uh, keep keep brushing up and brushing up and leaving that too too thin in the corner of the eyes. It's starting to get a little, a little thinner than I like, so I'm going to leave that now to set, and it'll have that flat layer right there. And uh, once that is a little set, doesn't have to be totally set. We don't want it to be totally set because 1630, 
is a material that does not stick to itself once it's totally cured. We have to catch it while it's still slightly fresh. Uh, if you can push a little bit and you feel just that little bit of resistance or a little bit of give, we're still good. Once it's totally hard and it's like a ceramic, it will not, it will not stick to itself. So we need to make sure that we uh, watch our material very closely and uh, that we're not, we're not leaving it too late. So I'm going to go ahead and leave that now and we'll come back when it's time to do the next coat. Okay, so you can see that that's slightly dulled now and if I push it, it leaves just a slight, see how it leaves that slight indent? That is called, that, that's what's referred to as soapy, so it's got just that little bit of give like soap and that's what we want. We don't want it to get too much more than that. So in the interest of time, just to do with straining and other things with this, I already measured out 800 of part A. So we'll tear that off. Now I'll add 800 of part B. I took a bit more time this time to make sure that there's not nearly as many lumps from the black one, part, uh, part A. Okay, so we're all even, we're ready to mix. Let's move this off to the side because the next part uh, is why we're doing it in front of my fans because uh, we're going to be thickening this particular batch up to a, to a very thick paste because we want to be able to have it hang on a... Um, a vertical surface without running down. We don't want it to run down at all. So to do this we're going to be using a material called cabosil. So cabosil is very hazardous. So make sure that we're wearing some kind of a respirator or a mask. Um, and uh, I'm going to put this right in front of my fans so that uh, any any excess that wafts up will just get pulled right out. Turn on the fans. Make sure you're scraping the sides really well. Make sure you're scraping the, the bottom or across around the bottom edges so we don't get any areas that aren't mixed. It's going to be harder for us to mix it once the cover seals in. This stuff's like asbestos on steroids, so you really don't want to breathe it because it will shred your lungs. Okay, so put quite a bit in. I'm just going to gently stir that. And you'll see some wafties going up and just going straight outside. Now, cabosil is a food thickener, and once it's mixed with liquid, it's totally harmless. It's just if you inhale it in its powder form, the uh, particles are so fine that they cause a lot of problems. Starting to look. See how it's starting to look like dough, and it's kind of dry looking. That's kind of what we want. And then you just kind of mix it so that all of that powderiness goes away. And it should end up looking like this. And you should be able to hold it up on a stick, and it's not going to uh, move. Make sure you scrape along the bottom, otherwise it'll stay really wet down there, and it's not going to. 
stay where you want it to. Do the test, see that's not quite staying, so we want to add just a little bit more. Now bear in mind there is a pot life involved in this, so you are going to have to kind of be quick. You know, don't, don't mess around. Now, if you're worried about the residue on the counter, um, at the end you can just take, take a spray bottle with some water in it and just mist the top and then wipe it up and it'll just become like a sludge. Okay, so that is now exactly how we need it. So, our thing back in, we'll turn off the fans because they're making a lot of noise. And we'll go ahead and do a bit of zooming in so you can see what's going on. So the, the risk you run if you just use a spatula is that if you scooch it in like this, you can get air pockets right in through here. That's still, you can see I still could put a dent in it so we're still good. Um, so what I normally do is for the first batch, I get a handful and I smoosh it right in around that bottom edge to make sure that there's no no air pockets anywhere. Make sure that we get it all the way up. Okay. Get a new, new glove, and now we're able to just use our paint stick, like a tool intensive for all intents and purposes, like a, um, a cake cake icer. And we're just going to add this in. Now you want this this edge to be beveled when you're going around. You want it. You don't want to have it super super close. Otherwise, you get a very thin spot right in where that corner was. So if you bevel this, it'll give you a, a pretty decent, pretty decent end result. Oh, you found the patch of cabasaw down there, was it? Okay, so you see that that's all beveled in now. We're going to start going along the top. So I guess the better you are at, at icing cakes, the, the better you'll be at this part. Now I want the bottom part to be fairly thick because we're going to grind away a portion of it to make the bottom flat so that it can stand on our sculpting stand a little more easily without rocking around and falling off and damaging the sculpt.
Okay, we're going to take our acetone, our brush. We're going to just sort of smooth out the bottom, smooth out the sides, get rid of any really sharp edges. Because this stuff can become like a ceramic knife. It'll be really sharp. I've sliced my hand so often with this just on, on edges and sharp, uh, sharp bits. So we definitely want to make sure that we get rid of any of the sort of sharp, potentially knuckle destroying areas. Okay, so that's fairly neat now. I'm going to go ahead and insert our handle and uh, just going to kind of work it down. See that I'm kind of spinning it in the top part just to coat the surface and then we're going to just take a little bit of what's left and just add some in. starting to thicken up pretty well at this point so just gonna just kinda bring that up and over the top like that just to add a little bit more strength Now, what I like to do sometimes is to coat the handle with the 1630. So I just add a little bit of the acetone into what's left and mix it into like a sludgy kind of paste. paint it the thing you gotta watch out for doing this is you don't want to have like sharp drips underneath the handle so if you look under the handle there you'll see there's all kind of drip marks so you're gonna have to constantly just kind of wipe those away Now really the only benefit for doing this, unless you're going to beef it up a lot, is just to make it look a little nicer, you know, so that it all kind of visually blends together. Make sure that you get rid of any ugliness that's fallen down on the inside of your mould.
I have done some molds where I've actually taken some of the paste and just coated the whole handle and then run it nice and flat so it's all squared and pretty. Um, it's it's nothing more than just vanity with uh, with the mold, you know. But I do like the handle being this, at least the same color as the rest of it. That seems to make a make a difference. At least to me, some people don't care. This isn't going to stay very nicely today. Again, this is uh, not really necessary um, unless you, you know, have just a personal, personal thing about your handle matching your mold <laughs> material. Uh, I think it looks much nicer myself. So. And just keep dipping, uh, dipping in and working, working the inside wall to try and get it nice and smooth and Okay, make sure we're working underneath because our hand's going to be going under there and the last thing we want is some hard pointy thing that's going to mash our hands when we're trying to weird flake bit there that's good So that's roughly an inch thick, which is a nice amount uh, if you're wanting to run foam in it because the foam will bake evenly. Uh, you're not got a part that's too thick and uh, it'll allow the heat to get in and, and, and bake out this way. If you're going to be doing uh, encapsulated silicone, it's nice because it's nice and strong. So you're not going to find that your material is warping, which can be a problem with 1630. Uh, can cause warping sometimes. Typically in a dish formation like this where it's even all the way around so it's a perfect semi semi sphere especially with the uh, the handle uh, I get minimal warping I'm not really worried about it with uh, this type of thing. If you're making your your negative mold 
um, out of 1630, you're going to want to take it all the way up. If, sometimes people do these molds where half of, where, where there's sections missing, and I can show you some of those in another video when we talk about different molds. But you don't want to ever do that with with 1630. You want it to always be a complete sort of bowl 360, and then that provides the best stability and prevents you from having warping, especially if you're baking it. So I'm going to go ahead and call that done. That looks pretty even and smooth, and, and we'll come back and demold that shortly. This is uh, almost totally cured. It still feels a little soft. You can see that I can put a slight dent in it with my fingernail there. I don't know if you can see that or not on camera, but uh, you can put a slight dent in. So I'm just going to take this. Uh, you can use anything. You can use a, a knife. I wouldn't use a razor knife just because they're probably a little too sharp. You don't want to damage your silicone. I'm just using a palette knife. You can use like a, a knife and, and just do it like, like this so that the pointy end is here if you want. Uh, I've used a palette knife. I've used all kinds of different things, but uh, you know, a paint scraper works well. But I'm just kind of going around making sure it's nice and clean. That way the chances of slicing your finger on this stuff is much uh, much less. You can see that it's not quite rigid yet. It's still a little floppy. It almost feels like a rigid silicone, you know. And so that, that, that's how you want it to be able to get this done. And I'm just going to hit that with a little bit of acetone just to dull it down a little so it looks a little nicer. And out it comes. Finished, finished thing. Now, this edge along here is going to be quite sharp once it dries. So you can get a razor knife. You can run it around, just take that sharp edge off. You can use a, a hand sander, or you can use a grinder. I normally prefer to just uh, give it a quick run around on the And I'm also going to go and grind it flat on the bottom. You see that's round. So when it sits on the on the uh, sculpting bench, it's going to move around. So now I've got it flat so that when it sits on the sculpting bench, the sculpting stand, it doesn't move around. And there we have our final thing that needs to sit for probably about another half an hour and it will be ready for us to, to sculpt on.